There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, this is a really special Zoom conversation that I'm bringing to you today. I would like you to meet Andrew Stovel Snyderman, who's a writer, lawyer, and Rhodes Scholar. And he's joining us from New York City today. And Douglas Sanderson, aka Amal, Amal Banashi, who is a law professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. And he is joined, and he's also a member of the Swamp, Swampy Cree Beaver Clan of the Opas Opasquayak Cree Nation. Very good. Welcome to both of you. Thanks so Real much for having us, Sean. So these guys have just brought out a book that came out a bit, maybe six weeks ago, two months ago, Valley of the Bird Tale, and I'll read the subtitle, An Indian Reserve, A White Town, and the Road to Reconciliation. I grabbed it when it was hot off the press and read it soon after, and it was a transformational read for me. And so I have invited these gentlemen on to tell us about the book and get you all to go out and buy it, buy copies, Christmas presents for all your friends and family. Makes and a great solstice most gift. Most importantly, read it. So Douglas, tell us about your, your guys' relationship, how you got to know each <laughs> other first. Yeah, we've been, uh, you know, we've been out on the road now for uh, the book came out on August 30th and our tour began a little bit after that. Um, so we were spending a lot of time together, finding out a lot about each other. <laughs> it's been really fun. Uh, but this project actually began uh, about 10 years ago. Well, I was uh, a professor at the University of Toronto and I, I taught a, a small class on property law, a little seminar for first year students. I didn't get to pick my students. I just get randomly assigned. And uh, I was fortunate to have uh, Andrew assigned in my class. He was you know, a fantastic student, of course. And we became friends. And I, I became aware that Andrew, you know, Andrew has a, a secret side life as a, as a journalist. And so he's written for you know, the New York Times and other papers. And I knew he was working uh, on an article for McLean's magazine. And I sort of like knew it was kind of about this little town in the prairies. But that's sort of all I knew. And then uh, Andrew and I stayed friends. And then about three years ago, Andrew approached me with a, a big chunk of manuscript and said that he would like it if I would join him in taking on this writing project. And I was a little hesitant at first because, you know, um, you, like it's a big responsibility <laughs> and it's a big lot of project. work. And you got to work with someone doing something that like I write professionally for a living. Like I'm an academic, but I still write. And so, you know, sharing the stage with someone, I was like, ah, oh. but I knew Andrew was really, really uh, smart. I knew he was a really good writer. And so I was happy to join the project at that point. And uh, we can talk more about the writing process and stuff uh, and stuff later. But maybe, maybe Andrew, you want to tell about, about the, the early part of the project and the development. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Douglas. Thanks, Sean. Well, I'll go back to that moment 10 years ago when I became aware of a problem, which in some ways is the problem that drew me into this project, which was unequal schools on reserves. And 10 years ago, I found out that if you were a student on a reserve, and there were over 100,000 students on a reserve, you were getting 40, sometimes 50% less funding for your education than students in provincial public schools. And I remember learning about this and going into Douglas's office. He reminded me of this a, a few days ago. And I went to him as a first year law student and I said, Douglas, how is this even legal? How is this possible? Which I, looking back is a pretty naive question, I think, but, but it was kind of the beginning of my outrage and interest. And I think over time, I've come to see this not just as a legal question, but, but way more interesting as a political and social question. How does something like that happen? How does it endure for all this time? And so what brought me to this these two communities, which this book is about, it's about this town called Rossburn, and a reserve called Weiwei Si Capo that are on either side of this beautiful valley called the Valley of the Bird Tail, which is the title of the book. And at first I got interested because these two communities had schools 
They were very close to each other, just a few kilometers away from each other. And the idea was to figure out what was it like as a student, as a community, to live in a place where your school was being shortchanged so much. And also, what was the point of view of the town just down the road? Did they notice? Did they care? How do they make sense of this? And if we could understand those two points of view, maybe we could understand something more broadly about Canada. And as Douglas and I came to work on this book together, the project became much more ambitious. So it is a lot about schools and about teachers, but it's also a much broader examination of how do these two communities, which are created at more or less the same time, about 150 years ago, when Canada was beginning as a country, how did these two communities become separate and unequal in the over time? And what can this tell us about the broader story of Canada? Absolutely. And there was something just particularly brilliant and uh, meaningful for me about how you chose to focus the story, because you could have written a book about education, educational history, uh, with a whole bunch of stats and stuff. And most of us, our eyes would have glazed over, even though it was important information that we needed to know to make some changes. But you focus it right down at the micro level, basically on two families, an Indigenous family from Weiwei Sakapo and a Ukrainian-Canadian family in the town, Rossburn, Manitoba. How did you arrive at that focus? Because, I mean, it read like a novel, and I mean that in, the, in you know, as a consumer voracious consumer the highest of compliment that's the right. highest compliment we could get how did you get to that to decide that how did that come about well let, let me just say a, a little I'll, I'll let andrew talk more in just a moment but it, it's funny i was reminded this the other day when we were uh, speaking with a friend in ottawa that you know a andrew and i are both lawyers and um i mean neither of us are practicing but we both been to law school and it's funny, in law school, like a lot of what we do is is we tell stories, right? Like that's what it is to write a case summary. That's what it is to write a memo. That's what it is to uh, file a factum with the court. You're, you're trying to tell a story that will persuade other people uh, to come to your point of view. And so, you know, I think that storytelling in some way comes sort of naturally to us both. And what we set out to do in the book is to try and take a number of very, you know, complicated ideas and messy historical facts and to lay them before the reader in a very steady and a very even tone, uh, consistent, and using, uh, to the extent we can, the lives of you know, real people. Some of them are alive today, and Andrew can talk more about about that, and some of them are historical, but we wanted to take the same tone and approach about using the lives of real people, because we're going to try and tell a very complicated story, and we're going to try and have an ending that looks forward and is positive, uh, but involves, again, like some, some complicated ideas. And using the lives of real people, we're able to show how those uh, ideas, uh, what they actually look like for real actors, and I think that's just a much more engaging read and, and much more interesting for readers to follow along uh, when they can relate to the story through the lives of real people. Absolutely. And I have to just call you on just a little bit about the lawyer thing, because I worked for lawyers for many years and I read a lot of stuff <laughs> lawyers wrote. And this is this is uh, not this is much, much better than the kind of prose <laughs> I'm familiar with. So. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, think it, I, I think it's true that, uh, you know, that there's various approaches to the law. <laughs> yeah, Please. I could just pick up on what Douglas was saying. I think part of what the book makes the book special, I think, is that we're really trying to capture the point of view of Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people and uh, people who are alive and people who are no longer with us and to try to be fair to all those points of view. And as Douglas was saying, we're really trying to tell an engaging story to walk through all these, this very difficult history that Canada has gone through and to translate the policy stuff and the big picture stuff and the stats into this very intimate portrait of people's lives. I'd like to set up how the, the novel opens. 
Freudian slip, it's not a novel. It's a masterful work of nonfiction that reads like a novel. Because the, 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 two, the two main characters that are in the closest to the present generation are driving, and I think they actually meet on the road, and I'd like you to introduce those two characters to us and what those drive, that those early morning drives are all about, because it was really powerful. Yeah, I might, I might start there. So the book opens up with two characters. One of them is a man named Troy Lahoe, and he's a gym teacher, and he's doing the few minute uh, drive from the town to the reserve. And Troy is interesting in part because I think a lot of us can see ourselves in him. He's a young Canadian who wants to play in the NHL when he grows up. And he's also important to the story because he's someone who doesn't know that much about Indigenous people. Basically nothing, even though he he grows up next to an Indigenous community. And he shows this extraordinary ability to learn and to grow over time. So there's Troy at the beginning of the story who's making his way to this reserve as a teacher. And he's very early on in his journey of getting to know this other community well. And coming in the other direction from the reserve is a young woman named Maureen, who's just started to go to high school in the town of mostly Ukrainian Canadians. So it's two members of neighboring communities traveling to their neighboring community. And in some sense, they're they're both, it's an uncomfortable journey because they're going to a very different place. And then from there, you built, you scaffold um, all of the historical, social, political stuff um, on kind of a geneal- genealogical deep dive going back through the generations of the Indigenous family and the settler family. It was just just the perfect way to tell this story. You guys have a great quote from Senator Marie Sinclair, uh, former chair of the TRC, who said, the truth will set you free, but first it's going to piss you off. So... Either of you take that quote and uh, do it, uh, run with it about uh, other stuff going on in this book. So I think it's a really prescient quote because we get asked a lot about reconciliation and, you know, we have some thoughts on it. But reality is that we're largely as a nation, I think, still coming to grips with the truth part. You know, the Kamloops Indian Residential School, other fines. I think have really, I think it was easy for people to say, you know, residential schools was a bad thing, but it happened long ago. I kind of feel bad about it, but I don't know what to do with that. The discovery of unmarked graves, uh, which is a thing that like in our communities, we've talked about for generations, like we've all listened to Having that revealed to the public, I, I think just made it impossible for people to not try and process some of the emotions that are involved in that. And that pisses people off, right? Like, because these are, you know, we as a country, in some sense, uh, we let these kids down. And what we see in Valley of the Bird Tale is that uh, by following these two families, by going back to the founding of their communities and following the characters forward, we are able to see not just the truth about our, our history, because I think in some ways we also we kind of know the pieces a little bit here and there, uh, but to be able to show how the government policies interlock one with the other, beginning 150 years ago and moving forward through time, building on one another. You know, it's and there's hard moments in the book where, you know, we quote, journals of Indian agents who say things like, you know, a little starvation will do them good. Absolutely. And that's, you know, even as an author, like as an academic too, I find that shocking. It stops me in my tracks. And we've often heard from people, from readers of the book that, you know, they, they loved it. Great read, but I had to put it down a couple of times. I just was so angry. And so I think that's the part, I mean, that is, that is what Marie Sinclair is talking about. The truth will help to set us free, but it it's not a pretty truth. We've tried to make it uh, readable. <laughs> and, I, and I think we've done a really good job there to tell a story. Yeah. Um, 
but it's not, you know, it's not always easy to take in, in part, I think, because I, I, I think people feel guilty in, about, you know, because they think they knew what happened, but to be able to see it all. I was even, you know, as someone who studies this, um, e even I was taken aback when I could see the whole story unfold and all of the policies one on top of the other. Uh, and I think that is, it is, um, that's hard for people. I think it's shocking. And I think it does, in fact, piss them off. Yeah, Andrew? We don't want to leave people just angry and pissed off, though it seems like that isn't a part of this journey as a reader. We do want to lift you up as a reader in the same way that the characters in the book are all on their journeys and they're all growing and, you know, persevering in their own ways to leave the reader in a place of hope. That's, and something hopeful happens in the lives of each of, of the characters and something hopeful is happening in these two communities, which misunderstood each other as much as any two neighbors could over the last 150 years, but have found a way in recent times to start listening to each other and to work together. So we, we think, and perhaps you, Sean, would agree, and perhaps readers out there would agree that there's enough books and stories out there that are just designed to outrage you and to leave you apoplectic. We we think there's going to be some of that experience here, but we don't. We want to do more than that. We are actually hopeful about about the future. We and and we want to bring that to the reader, and readers, I think, have reason to be hopeful, and I think it's our responsibility as as authors and academics, to bring that hope to them when we can. I uh, was really cynical about this whole thing about reconciliation until I read your book. So this book did give me hope that other readings, other readings that have been re extremely important for me, but they just keep stoking the, the outrage. Um, and I've just not been a big fan of reconciliation because to me it's just like a a land acknowledgement here and a land acknowledgement there, and we're all good to go. And uh, what your book did for me was to show how, however fumblingly, progress has already started to be made. And I don't know if you want to get into the details of it or not, but you do go into a lot of detail about how the two communities, Rossburn and Wei Wei Capital Reserves, sorted out or took a huge and quite innovative leap towards sorting out the funding gap and that was just something that wow that really gave me a lot of hope people can put their heads together and come up with something that's going to kind of get us out of this yeah i mean i'll briefly say that an extraordinary thing does happen in this story as you're as you're saying sean which is that about 10 years ago these two communities start working together to get every indigenous student equal funding and that's a great story because unsurprisingly, they start doing better very quickly with adequate resources. But also it's an absurd story because it's such so obviously the right thing to do that it just draws a contrast with all the other places where it wasn't happening. And the other thing, unfortunately, to underline is that the thing that brings these two communities together, it's it wasn't the wrongness of what was going on. It wasn't only that. It wasn't like people decided one day, no, these indigenous kids are being mistreated and this is wrong. We need to correct that wrong. It was a recognition on the side of the, the town and surrounding towns that it's in our self-interest to work with these with this indigenous school nearby. And I hope that at the end of the book, Douglas and I are gesturing towards this larger point, which is that it's really, you know, it's morally the right thing to do to invest in indigenous children and communities, but it's also very much in our self-interest to do that. I think when we started, we were going to get to the end and there was going to be the big coming together of the reserve school and the town school. And there would be a lesson there for all of us about, you know, increased funding. And if we just, you know, put our nose to the grindstone, we can get results. But as we were making our way through the story, it started to dawn, I think, on both of us that we could take the moral from the story that, you know, increased funding leads to better results. But 
there's a way in which that was maybe a false conclusion. And what we started to think about was, you know, one, the reason that this worked in this particular instance is, and the federal, you know, we, we interview the federal civil servants who, who are in charge of the purse strings at some points. And they say, the reason we could do this, because it's so tiny. It's just like, a, you know, a $3 million and a $7 billion budget, super easy. And, but what that means is that it's not going to happen, you know, widespread. And we, although to the credit of this current government, you know, they have actually managed to equalize the funding. So what we saw was, though, that the decision to increase the funding was like it was difficult to do right, politically and it can be undone at any time. And so what we started to think about then was like, what other lessons can we take from this example? We started to, I think, think more about the dynamics of the two communities coming together because it's in their own best interest. And then thinking about how we could secure, like really secure a future for indigenous children's education. And it occurred to us that the, you know, the way you do that is you put the reserves in charge of the funding, right? They're not going to rip their kids off. And that requires a different set of tools and solutions. But it's one that I think we were luckily prepared to engage with using the familiar techniques that, that we use th throughout the book. So you've grounded the reader in these very personal stories and threaded the historical stuff all through that and the social political stuff. And then you, in a way, take a sharp turn but having building on that to make to ha have us open to this to me i mean huge big new idea about how to get ourselves out of it that it now but do you want to say more about it now or just tell people to read the book but uh, how does the book end what we do at the end is we suggest that like if we're really serious about fixing this problem then that you know we have tools available to us maybe i'll just describe something that we don't talk about in the book at all, but I think it'll be helpful to, to the listeners. And that's for many years now, Canada has engaged with First Nations in comprehensive land claims. And they happen in British Columbia, they happen in James Bay, they happen in the Yukon. And these agreements uh, effectively provide those communities with the power and authority to regulate what happens in their territory. So it's, it's, they get a chunk of land, and they have the authority then to, you know, tax resource extraction and to spend that money, you know, however they want. And I think that something about that model is something is the kind of thing that we're sort of proposing in the end. We're showing how the various tools that are familiar to federal negotiators and, you know, and many Canadians, I think, uh, how we could apply them more broadly so as to provide Indigenous communities uh, with more land and more ability to make decisions and a way of sharing that wealth more broadly so that it, it, it's not coming at the expense of any particular set of taxpayers. And I'll, and I'll just say that we made a very deliberate choice to save all that solution-oriented discussion to the very end of the book. And so the reader gets 300 pages of stories, which in some sense it is an argument for the argument that we present at the end. And so I hope the reader can have the experience of having 300 pages of stories where they're being, I hope that the re reader feels respected and they're being given a lot of space and they're not being told what to think. And then at the end, we say, yeah, here's what we think. Here's some ideas going forward. And and we want to provoke some some debate about the right way to go forward. And we we didn't want to just cop out and say, well, we were just telling a story. We wanted to kind of put on the table, here's how we think we might go forward. And, and I think we should be the first to say that like, the ideas that we have here, you know, they may not be the ultimate solution, uh, but hopefully they can help start a dialogue. Someone can explain to a reader who asks questions like why this won't work, right? Or what else would you propose we do instead? But we're just, we're so tired of, you know, the solution is a new program and the solution is more spending. But it, I think it's time and I think Canadians broadly feel like we need to do something differently and we want to try and tap into that impulse both by showing why we need to do something differently 
Uh, why would we need to do something differently for 150 years? But now that people are engaged with uh, ideas, start throwing out new approaches to this. It's not an intractable problem, right? It feels that way, but it, it, there are solutions available. And we just want to point out what some of them might be. What are the tools we have available to us? So you also get into the, the kind of the personal transformations that also bring hope that people, not only uh, societies and, and bureaucracies can change and become open to new things, but also on the, that micro personal level. So tell us about Nelson, Troy's father. Yeah, I think Nelson is a really important character. And Nelson is someone who grows up in this town and has effectively no contact with the Indigenous people who inhabit this community that that neighbor his town. And there's a moment, which I think is an important moment in the book, where he's a young person being driven to a baseball game. And he, he is going down this road and he sees up on a hilltop a, a huge building. And he asks his parents what that is. And his parents tell them it's, it's an Indian school. It's a residential school. And in Nelson's eyes, he sees this place as an imp impressive, imposing building that he's jealous of. He sees his own rural school where, you know, all the students are in one room from all the grades. He sees it as this ramshackle place and he feels like he's kind of being hard done by. And he grows up his entire life where he, all he's got in his head are stereotypes that are never verified with an actual Indigenous person in his life. And it's only in his late 60s that kind of accidentally he gets hired to do adult ed on the reserve that he actually has contact with indigenous people he actually has conversations with people and he, he starts hearing their stories and part of what's amazing about nelson is that he starts to come to terms with his own racism and that's like that's a word that he uses and he comes for the first time to start learning about all the stuff he didn't know and starts to care a little bit more and starts bit by bit to earn the respect of people on the reserve to the point where you know if you were walking around with Nelson today he's he uses crutches because he had polio as a as a boy you know, if he showed up at a hockey game on the reserve, any number of people would would pull out a chair for him to sit. And he's greeted very warmly. And that's really a, a beautiful thing. And I think there's a key moment at the end of the book where he says, I'm just paraphrasing something like, you know, I was racist. And I probably still am in some ways. And that level of self-awareness and that journey that he's on, I, I hope, is something that, that a lot of us can see ourselves in. I want to uh, talk for just a little bit about, about Maureen, uh, who we were introduced Jeez. to earlier. And I guess I, it's important to know that, you know, while the characters in the book, who are real people, uh, learn and change and grow, it's, it's not just uh, the settler characters. In fact, the indigenous characters learn yes. about their settler neighbors, things they did not know at all. And... You know, in, in researching the book, we, we came across this foundational moment in our national history when a guy named Clifford Sifton, who's Minister of the Interior, has, is signing treaties and moving Indians onto reserves. And now the, the prairies are effectively cleared and it's time to populate them. And Clifford Sifton launches an enormous program. Uh, to draft Ukrainian immigrants, Ukrainian peasants in particular, who at that time are being oppressed by Russia. Hundreds of thousands of them come uh, to populate the prairies. And, you know, this explains, you know, <laughs> I grew up a little bit on the prairies. There's Ukrainians everywhere, right? And, uh, and there's sort of this background trope in Canada, the Ukrainian-Canadian. But I never stopped to ask why. And Maureen learns about this Ukrainian part of her history. And what she learns is, you know, after the Ukrainians came, you know, they, they experienced massive racism, exactly the same way that Maureen had experienced. When World War I starts, Ukraine at that time is still allied uh, with the Tsar, 
So we intern all of these Ukrainians. So they, while indigenous people are trapped on reserves under the pass system, right next door, there's an internment camp with their Ukrainian neighbors. And neither of these two communities knows anything about their shared history. And as they learn the truth about history, they're able to generate more and more empathy for their neighbors. And I think that's a lot of what we're trying to do in the book is to generate that empathy by by showing how these these communities are very alike. But they're also probably a lot like uh, experiences that many Canadians have had. And there's so much nuance that you uh, trace in the book, because one of the differences that you uh, that's really powerfully described between the Ukrainian experience in Canada and the indigenous experience was around the dance, Ukrainian dance and indigenous dances. Does anybody want to talk about that? There's a couple, I think, interesting stories to tell about the dancing, because part of what makes the story of Ukrainian Canadians interesting and f- fundamental to this book and also to Canada is that it's almost like the beginning of multiculturalism, people talking about multiculturalism in Canada. And what you see pretty early on is that federal leaders who are welcoming Ukrainians into Canada, they celebrate Ukrainian culture and they they encourage Ukrainians to hold on to their traditions. And there's this as you were suggesting, Sean, there was kind of this interesting moment where the governor general of Canada is attending this dance of Ukrainian children, and it's it's very jolly event. And at the that exact moment, Canada has made it a criminal offense for Indians to do ceremonies, including dances, and they're being shut down. And that contrast is devastating. And there's, I think, the most powerful scene to me in the book, at least, is this juxtaposition between a dance on Wayway Capital being shut down by federal agents, by RCMP officers. You know, it's a ceremony, a local ceremony is shut down with a display of force by the federal government. And at the exact same moment, there's this big party being held in Ottawa in the Senate chamber, which is cleared cleared of all of, of its chairs. And there's this great big party. And there's a group of people who think it would be funny to dress up as Indians. They're all, they're all white uh, people. And they dress up as Indians and they kind of hoot and holler and they're shaking around these fake tomahawks. And the person leading that troop is the gentleman, not a gentleman, actually, the person who's in charge of the government policies criminalizing the dances. So it's this completely absurd moment that everyone finds hilarious. And there couldn't be a more crushing contrast between how the government is treating one community as opposed to another. And we're welcoming these newcomers, or at least the government is at that point, and we're oppressing another. Absolutely. And you're talking, of course, about Hater Reed, who I have renamed Hateful Reed. Yes. <laughs> very uh, aptly named, very aptly named character. Yes, that, that was uh, one of the more powerful scenes in the, in the novel for me, too, that juxtaposition. Anything else that you guys would like to say, please have at it. Yeah, so I think the one detail that I think is actually, it, it, you know, it's it's about the book, but it's not about the book. But I think it's interesting, nonetheless. It, the way the book actually got written, you know, process wise, yes. which was, you know, I think I said at the beginning that, that Andrew came to me about three years ago. And I remember this evening of going down into my basement where I you know, have a large monitor and I can stand and look, look, read. And I remember in the background hearing about this virus going around in China <laughs> and very quickly as the like just as we were getting started uh the pandemic unfolded and so andrew and i wrote the book and we saw each other actually once in in the in two years and it was like we we were at an event we were on stage i think we managed to grab dinner together later but the whole thing was done uh with zoom and google docs and this really interesting process of 
going through and trying to find words or sentences or paragraphs that we just thought could be better. And maybe I'd try a few different times and then I'd leave it for Stobo and he would do the same with me. And so we would just pass these writing assignments back and forth. It became a very workmanlike process. It meant that very quickly, nobody knew who had written what originally. <laughs> and so the whole book eventually gets rewritten in some ways. If you're wondering like, oh, I can't get anything done during my pandemic project. <laughs> it, it turns out with the right writing partner, uh, a lot is possible. Do you think you're going to do something like this again? Another book? Um, we've talked uh, We've talked about, um, you know, maybe uh, something more academic, <laughs> which is that I think that a lot of the ideas at the end are uh, interesting, but there are all kinds of reasons why uh, I think they need to be expanded and uh, justified. You know, that's primarily an academic project. Although we may try and do it in a, a way that's more reader friendly. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I will allow you to do an academic book, but then you also have to promise maybe to try a novel, write a novel together too. Oh, interesting. Interesting. You have the, you have the literary gifts. Um, if this is a stupid question, I'll edit it out, but I'd like to ask you each to share something that you didn't know before you started this project that you know now. And take that question any way you want. Yeah, I mean, most of this I did not know. And I think maybe what's something that's special about the book is that even people who know a lot, and I would not have counted myself among those people, we're finding that when we talk to readers, even readers who really have worked in this area, they're finding a lot that they didn't know. So there's something in it for everyone. And I, I hope that what we've done is also create the best introductory text for someone who doesn't know anything at all to be introduced to all these issues. Yeah. And, and, and beyond that, bra totally brand new things for me were the story of the Ukrainian migration to Canada at the end of the 19th yeah. century. It's totally gripping and inspiring and to be celebrated. You know, it's this, there's this massive effort by the Canadian government to send thousands of agents into Europe to pay people to come here and to set them up in Canada for success with basically free land. And those immigrants do face real racism from other Canadians who are already here, but the, the Canadian federal government stands with them and shows some real backbone and it's pretty inspiring. And what's tragic about all that is that at the exact same moment, as Douglas was saying earlier, the exact same person who's in charge of bringing hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians to Canada is also in charge of Indian affairs. And he is restricting people on reserve. He is in charge of enforcing criminalization of dances. He's in charge of residential schools. And so there's this very inspiring story happening at the same time as a very tragic story. And, and part of what we're trying to do in the book is to kind of show those two parallels. And there's some commonalities, which I think are interesting about the experience of Ukrainians and the experience of Indigenous Canadians, but there's this fundamental divergence in the way that the government is treating them, which explains a lot of why the outcomes are so unequal over time. Douglas. I think I was familiar with a lot of the historical pieces, but what I think I learned and I'm still really processing is, as I said earlier, it's the totality of the experience. It's and, and it's the way in which the policies are not like, oh, there's a past system and then separately there's a residential school system. It's that the two are designed to work together, right? The, you, you keep you put a past system in place to keep parents on reserve so they can't visit their children, right? Like. Each one of those policies is cruel on its own, but to combine them together with intention, with the intention to harm others, that was, um, I think, there's a degree of, you know, the indifference that is really hard to stomach. And I found that uh, having to face 
you know, face the reality that, the, that these are actual choices made by people for one reason or another. And I, I think later on in the book, to, towards the end, you know, we do make a concerted effort to talk about, and we hope we do respectfully, um, to talk about racism and to talk about many of the things that, you know, settler and even some indigenous people believe and to take those take those concerns seriously. Like we want to change people's minds and we can't do that by confronting them or mocking them. So even people who we strongly disagree with, we try to be, and I think we are as fair as possible to them and to take their concerns and arguments seriously which is to say they require a serious rebuttal. And, and so yes. I think we try and we try and provide that as well. And I think earlier you had asked about, you know, which book would I recommend? I actually have two and right. they're sort of related to Valley, but not at all, but they're both historical works like Valley. And they both challenge an existing narrative about the past. And I think that Valley of the Bird Tale does that in some sense. It, it concretizes the historical narrative between indigenous and settler people in a factual way. This book by Graeber and Wengro, uh, The Dawn of Everything, was a nonfiction work that challenges basically everything we think we know about the development of mankind. Amazing. And similarly, Pekka Hamblinen's Indigenous Continent is a specific rewriting of the encounter between indigenous and settler people. So they're both historical, they're both fact-based, but they both work to upend what we think we know about the past. And I think Valley of the Bird Tale, uh, it, it works in much the same way. I wasn't aware of the first one and I uh, was a little suspicious of the second one because it was written by someone who sounds like they're from Finland, but- uh, I believe it I, is a Finnish author, but it's yeah, very good yeah. nonetheless. <laughs> okay, I'll take that recommendation for sure. Andrew, how about you? I would recommend a book called Evicted by a guy named Matthew Desmond. I think it won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. It's about Milwaukee housing in Milwaukee. And he follows for a long time different families as they deal with eviction. And I think part of what's amazing about this book is that he really tries to inhabit the point of view of real people in a way that I found inspiring in the writing of this book. But also, I think he reminds us that it's possible to write a great nonfiction narrative where the author is not the, the hero or, or of the story, where the author isn't present. And I think one of the things that I really like about the book we've written is that Douglas and I are not in the story. Like, it's not about us. And I think that's important. I think we, you know, there's a foreword that's about two pages long where we permit ourselves you know, the word we, but it's not about us. It's that we really foreground the characters and the story who are real people who are using their real names. They're the, they're the heroes. And at the end of the book, there's an afterword by Maureen Two Voice, yes. which I think is perhaps the most beautiful part of the book where she's writing in her own voice yeah, I just just so at the end, so there's no concern about non-law readers. There's not a single legal argument anywhere in the text. We never Absolutely. attempt anything remotely like a legal argument. It, it's all storytelling. It's all storytelling. And uh, I would, if I hadn't known anything about you guys, I would have been shocked to hear that you were lawyers. <laughs> would have thought maybe you were novelists trying your first work of nonfiction, but not 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 lawyers. This has been a fascinating conversation. To reiterate, it's just an incredibly transformational read. I urge people to read it. Who 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 in the government has? Uh, maybe you can't tell me any names, but um, have you been getting responses from some people that can actually take these ideas and run with them? Uh, well, we recently had opportunity to, um, there was um, the Institute for Research on Public Policy uh, had their 50th anniversary and we, we got to speak there and everyone who attended got a book. So oh, that was there, the one on Instagram you were signing about. Yeah, so copies? there were 
a 340, I think, but they were Supreme Court justices and former cabinet ministers and senior government officials. And, you know, so all of the people you'd want, I think, to uh, have the opportunity to to read the book. We are doing our best to try and get the book into the hands of, of, of you know, government officials and people who, I mean, the politicians are important too, but so are the civil servants because they're there for the long term, right? So we're doing what we can to try and start a dialogue uh, um, among those persons uh, and more broadly. One of the things that's great is that those people are used to very boring stuff. So by comparison, this will be very exciting. But I think more fundamentally, the book is aimed at Canadian citizens. And we're, we want this to be a book that, that uh, we think change happens that way. You know, it could be people with power in a back room in Ottawa, but more, I think, as Douglas was saying earlier, we wrote this book to inform and persuade and touch Canadians. That's who it's for. It's it's not it's not to hand a, a blueprint necessarily for to a, for a very powerful person to change everything. It's for all of us to take another step in this conversation together. Because if we're going to make change, it's going to be because a lot of us learn more and decide that we care more and that we're more interested as a, as a country to make things better. This book gave me a lot of hope. And I think it's also the kind of engaging book that is going to light a fire under people's butts that we're not familiar with. You know, just like you say, that we're kind of ignorant or just not, what, not well informed. And it's, it's a great book to, to get inner dialogues and, uh, interpersonal dialogues going and make some more change. What a delight to have you guys here to tell us about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Douglas.